Good evening. Uh, my name is Mutaz. I am one of the chronic pain consultants at Stop Hill. It does say uh, medical management, and I will touch upon that, and mainly medical. I will speak about it more broadly. Um, but most of it's going to be about assessment because I think the assessment, especially when it comes, patients are coming to us, forms, it decides which path you're going to take or what you're going to concentrate more on as part of your treatment strategy. Um, just to echo what Jenny said, uh, lower back pain is common and chronic or persistent or recurrent lower back pain is common. Uh, the vast majority of, majority of it is managed in primary care. Only a small, small percentage of patients come to the pain clinic, but they are the patients that take up all the time and a lot of the resources. It's a symptom, it's not a diagnosis in its own right. It's a very complex entity, it's caused by a variety of different possible factors. And as I've alluded to, for the same kind of changes you might find in your MRI, some patients have no pain, some patients have pain that they manage quite well, and other patients are completely disabled. A lot of the time, well, but the patients that come to the pain clinic have usually been through numerous specialties before, and they've had a very biomedical approach, and it hasn't had any significant impact and they've ended up coming here. And that is again because it's complicated, it's not just a biomedical approach. A lot of the time, the first time that somebody's looked at it in another way is when we see them. Effect sizes for various treatments are modest at best, and that's true. And that's another reason why we would assess patients in a biopsychosocial way. I've kind of tried to highlight what I would do when I see a patient in clinic. At some point during the consultation, I try to identify the reason why they're here. Patients have various expectations of the pain clinic. Uh, some people arrive because they want a diagnosis. They've seen lots of people and they've done nothing. Nothing's helped. They've only got worse and they want a diagnosis. Other people are looking for medication in particular or injection. Other people want, are fed up with medications. They want to find another approach. So it's always worth trying to identify that because it will make the consultation easier and more focused. And actually, probably the patient feels a lot better out of it because they've had their feelings and thoughts addressed. I would then go on to assess the pain as we all would, um, screen for serious pathology and red flags. I would then go on to look for diagnostic subgroups. Now I'm talking specifically here about patients with chronic non-specific lower back pain. We would of course screen to make sure it is non-specific and we've not missed a red flag in particular. And even though it's called non-specific, I still try and kid myself that maybe I could work out where it is coming from precisely. And so I kind of go through that and I'll talk about that briefly. Um, and then I'll assess for not just their pain and associated symptoms, but their functional level, their disability, their work level, and identify psychosocial flags, which will uh, guide my treatment. So here are some specific causes of pain, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. These are mostly the red flags, cancer, the inflammatory arthritis, infection, fracture, but also not forgetting referred pain. And probably the biggest one to exclude is the last one that I've put there is hip. So important to remember that and examine for that. And of course, abdominal causes, any um, pelvic organ disease, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, and the rest can, do have an element of back pain to a greater or lesser degree. So I'll quickly run through the red flags. Um, I'm sure we're familiar with these. The extremes of age would be a red flag. And as Jenny said, not just for cancer, so to speak, but in the younger uh, range would be for other possible red flags. A history of cancer, unexplained weight loss. The top three are fairly strong red flags. The bottom three aren't so strong. Nighttime pain or rest pain, failure to improve with therapy, pain persists for, persists for greater than six weeks. Almost every single person I see in the pain clinic will have nighttime pain or rest pain 
they, by definition, haven't improved with therapy by the time they've seen me, and their pain has, by definition, persisted for more than that period of time. So you wouldn't base your imaging criteria based on one single red flag. I think we all know that, but it's more a collection. Infection, uh, again, the stronger ones, if they're systemically unwell, there's, then there's a high chance it's coming, could be coming from their back. A history of drug abuse, recent infection, if they're immunocompromised, if they've got severe pain, and I've seen a few patients with discitis in the past and they are in severe pain, uh, and previous or recent lumbar surgery. Cauda equina, and uh, I'm sure we all know this, urinary incontinence retention, reduced anal tone, faecal incontinence, saddle anaesthesia, paresthesia, bilateral weakness, numbness, or progressive neurological deficit even in one limb. Red flags are very much to uh, remind people to look for these so you don't go down symptomatic management and there's something actually going on and alert people to, you know, go and actually rule these conditions out. Uh, once I've done that, then I'll go and kind of try and work out maybe where the, these symptoms are predominantly coming from. And if it was discogenic, you would expect a younger patient population, maybe an acute injury, and is exacerbated by motion, twisting, flexion, coughing, sneezing, straining might make it worse. Facet joint, if you read the literature, they say that chronic lower back pain, facet joints are to blame anything between roughly 15 to 45% of the time, which is a high proportion, if that is correct. Generally, it'll be lower back pain reading into buttocks, worse with extension or coming back up to neutral, very tender paravertebrae and positive quadrant test, which is extension, lateral flexion and rotation. Now, they're all very non-specific and you'll see, you'll see the problem because they all do merge into one roughly. If your pain was coming from an SI joint, then you would have buttock pain rather than lower back pain, but of course you can have both. It radiates into the hip and the groin, so there's a massive overlap with the hip. Uh, there's a few examinations that you can do which may lead you to think SI joint. The Faber test, flexion, a, B, duction and external rotation. In that position, if that brings on their pain, then it could be coming from your SI joint or your hip. There's Ganslin's test, which again stresses the SI joint, forced hip abduction in the flamingo. Um, if you have a positive to all four, it is claimed that has a higher sensitivity and specificity for sacroiliac joint origin. Uh, hip, again, that could present solely as back pain could again go into the groin and then the anterior thigh could be accused, uh, confused with a upper lumbar radiculopathy as well, potentially. Uh, that is positive with Faber test and Trendelenburg. And then after that, I would go into asking questions about their social history and a psychiatric, psychological history. Um, we've all heard the yellow flags. There are also orange, blue and black flags. And essentially, the, they are predictors for chronicity. So they're useful at the acute stage. If you can identify some psychosocial flags, that patient has a high risk of developing or going on to develop persistent pain. And if these issues are addressed at an early stage, then you may be able to prevent that. But even at the chronic stage, it's well worth assessing for because they are barriers to successful treatment. Uh, you can give them as much medication or intervention as you like, but if you don't actually address these barriers, you won't, or find, you'll find it difficult to get past. And it's important to stress it's not a diagnosis, it's not a symptom, it's not something to say that this patient is at it, it is you're identifying a barrier to better care. The orange flags are essentially the mental health equivalent of red flags. It is something that if you pick up, really, that's something you have to deal with first before you carry on with everything else. And that would be a referral to a specialist in that field. Examples would be addictions, which would be a big one that we would see. A clinical depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, major personality disorder. It's very hard to get a patient to engage with the treatment that we would provide. Um, a lot of our therapies 
are medic medications and injections, but also psychology and physiotherapy. And for that to be beneficial, you have to engage. And if you have one of these orange flags, it'll be very difficult to engage in that treatment. The yellow flags are all about the person. They're all about their attitudes, their beliefs, their cognitions, their fears, their emotions, and how that leads them to behave. So you might have somebody who believes nagging in the back of their mind that what they have is cancer. And it doesn't matter what you tell them, they believe it's cancer and they won't take on board anything. You'll get some people that expect the worst. They don't expect any of your treatments to work and pretty much they won't. If you have to actively engage in something and you don't believe it's going to work, then it's not going to work. Uh, they might change their behaviour because of this. They might uh, feel their pain is uncontrollable and likely to worsen and they say, well, what's the point? What's the point of me trying to think I can't do anything? I basically just want you to give me something that is going to help me. Or they might be chasing a diagnosis. They might have picked up the diagnosis in the wrong way. Somebody's told them you've got some degenerative discs, therefore their spine is crumbling. There's nothing they can do about it and they're not going to try. They might be quite passive, i.e. expecting things to be done to them. Probably the biggest predictor of chronicity would be the catastrophizing, uh, which is jumping to the worst possible conclusion. Blue flags are work-related. Somebody who has potentially low job satisfaction, uh, poor support at work. They may have been off work for a while and the thought of going back to work really worries them. They're scared that they can't cope or won't be able to cope. Their employer might not be so sympathetic to them. Stress with colleagues. And black flags are to do with context. Essentially, there's a bit of overlap with black flags and other flags, but it is something that is out with the control of the patient and the treating team. So the most common one would be a claims procedure. If somebody's got an insurance claim, it's unlikely they'll make any progress with anything you plan to do with them. And it's better for them to get that sorted first before they come back. Uh, financial issues uh, with benefit cuts. It does put people under stress. They find it difficult to do anything that's an issue. Family and friends, if they're overbearing, that can be a problem. If they're unsupportive, that can be a problem. Overbearing may, might encourage a passive approach and expect things to be done for them. If they're socially isolated as well, it can make things difficult. So I suppose it really depends on the context that you're seeing the patient. If you're a GP and you've seen them multiple times, I suppose all these things come out in the wash. You don't specifically have to go looking for them. You just get that feeling with time and seeing them many times. In the pain clinic where you're seeing them once and intermittently, then you do have to kind of ask screen, screening questions to bring up that conversation. And uh, open questions are better. How are you coping with things? How does that make you feel? It's quite an easy segue from your social history if the social history uh, makes them cry, which more often than not does happen. And then also trying to probe into what they see the future holds to them for them will also bring on that conversation where these things can be teased out. I then move on to examination. And as Jenny said, I don't know how much I really pick up from examining a patient. Most of it is from the history. Unless there's a good going dermatomal weakness or sensory loss, not really that much. Generally, range of movement varies. What does it mean to me? Not too much. They're generally tender. Uh, I do examine for hip and neurological uh, examination when required. Imaging. I think uh, I'm referring to Jenny quite a lot in my talk. Um, as she quite rightly says, and as we probably know, that MRIs are very, very sensitive and you'll pick up a lot. And the vast majority is misleading. There's a lot of trials that say essentially what that says. Uh, 98 MRIs in pain-free volunteers mean age 42. Just over a third had normal discs at all levels. These are all pain-free volunteers. Greater than 50% had a bulging disc. Greater than 20, a greater than a quarter of them had a protruding disc. So, it doesn't really tell you much most of the time. And in fact, you know, a lot of what it tells you is spurious. And that can have a detrimental effect on the patient. A lot of patients want an MRI, um, 
But the problem is, if you then come back and tell them they've got a degenerative disc and they take, pick that up the wrong way, then that could have a negative effect on their ongoing therapy. There have been trials where they've assessed people with a back pain who have not had imaging and who have, and at follow-up at six months, um, the patients with abnormalities in their MRI have gone on to uh, do worse than the patient who haven't had imaging at all. There's also evidence that in areas where there's a lot, or, or there's more MRIs, there is more intervention, but there's no better outcomes despite injections or surgery. And it can all be linked to imaging. So what NICE recommend is to not offer lumbar spine x-ray for the management of non-specific low back pain. And in fact, I was reading in the BMJ a few months ago that there's a top 10 list of things you must not do as a doctor. And number one is lumbar spine x-ray for chronic lower back pain. Uh, you should only consider MRI if there's a red flag you want to look for or rule out. The only other reason to do an MRI in non-specific lower back pain is if you're wanting to refer or thinking about referring for spinal fusion. Otherwise, you should just keep under review and look for indications that may uh, show themselves in the future. So, uh, on to the management. As I said, it's difficult to treat. There's multiple levels and multiple potential causes of back pain. So it would be wrong to anticipate that having had specific treatments and investigations from all the people that have seen them before, that then we have something that we can give them that will work. Um, it's rarely possible to provide complete pain relief. And although that sounds obvious to us, I think with patients, it's not so obvious. And I think part of the problem in managing chronic back pain is managing expectations. And it is definitely worth a conversation about that and make them aware. What we, what we say or what I say is a good effect is probably not what you would think is a good effect. And I would say to them, if, if we get a 20-30% reduction with these medications, then that would be an excellent result as far as I'm concerned. Just to give them some kind of idea of what we're talking about here when it comes to medicines. So, as I've alluded to, one, one approach is unlikely to be successful and a multidisciplinary approach has better effect. And the multidisciplinary approach is just that. So, education, acceptance, um, and focusing not just on pain relief, but increased function and improved quality of life. And that's something uh, I do, and I'm sure we all do spend a lot of time discussing, taking the focus solely away from the pain and more about, that is your pain, that's where we are, how can we improve your life? We can use medicines, we can use physio, we can use psychology, we can use interventions. It's better if we use a combination of all, including education. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through the medications. There's not a great deal of evidence for any of the medications we use, really. Paracetamols and non steroidals are effective for short-term pain relief. Uh, again, long-term, there's no good studies. Antidepressants, the problem with this, there's no long-term, there's no good studies and there's no long-term studies. Uh, antidepressants, conflicting results. Uh, at best, modest, 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 I can't say that word, effective than placebo for pain and function. Do come with significant side effects. Anticonvulsants, good for radicular pain. Well, yeah, good for radicular pain. Uh, numbers needed to treat in about the four to six. Uh, but for the back pain itself, it's not so great. There's some evidence for gabapentin uh, for spinal, uh, spinal stenosis, but again, it's not fantastic. Benzodiazepines, good for acute exacerbations, but come with problems uh, and limited evidence in the long term, which is kind of the same for opiates. Uh, there's no good long-term studies of opiates in chronic pain. Uh, they're all short-term, they all have problems with their methodology, and they all exclude the patients that we would see in clinic who have uh, psychiatric comorbidities. So it'd be wrong then to say that that study that has shown good um, analgesic relief and function is going to apply for our patient population. 
And as we all know, they come with significant, not just personal side effects, but social problems as well. Um, but, you know, some people do respond to opiates. You can't predict who is going to respond, but some people do get a good response. And it does let them improve their function, so on. So therein lies the problem. Uh, Cochrane have gone back and looked at a lot of their opiate studies and have actually retracted any kind of statement where they've said there is benefit. Again, because of poor methodology, they've included people who did have a good response, but were then had to drop out of the trial because of nausea or decreased cognitive function. They have taken that good result and taken it to the end. And there's other methodological flaws like that. Um, but getting back to the point, what we would recommend is a trial in carefully selected patients. So there's a number of uh, risk tools out there, the opioid risk tool for one, that you can use to decide whether it would be safe with less risk to try an opioid trial on that patient. They would then have a trial for a set period of time and their response to pain and function would be assessed. If they failed that trial, they would then come off opiates and that would essentially be that which is good in theory, but in practice it's very difficult to do. It takes a lot of time, frequent visits, and I feel that a lot of the time the opioid trial just by default becomes opioid therapy, and a lot of problems can stem from that. Uh, going on to interventional techniques, we do a lot of injections, and there's not a lot of good evidence for a lot of the injections we do. However, the ones I'm going to talk about, there is some good evidence for them, um, again, rather like the opiates, it's the role of interventions. The problem with interventions are they work well generally for a very short period of time. Can you just keep on doing them? Well, not really. It encourages a passive approach. You're giving them high doses of steroids regularly, which is not good for their long-term health and is actually going to add to their problems. But if you're using them as part of a multidisciplinary package and you're hoping that the benefit they get, they can then use to maximise physiotherapy and other modalities, then that would be a worthwhile thing to do. But again, it's important to explain the patient to the patient that that is their role and it is not intended as a long-term treatment strategy. Uh, facet joint injections and medial branch blocks, they themselves don't have a lot of good evidence for, however, radio frequency of the medial branches does. Uh, both have... Uh, poor sensitivity and specificity. But we do them. And again, like the opiates, facet joint injections are easy to do and some people have a very good response to them. And if that helps their overall package, then it's worthwhile. Um, where medial branch blocks come in are patients who have a good response to a facet joint injection, but it only lasts a few weeks. They'll maybe have over 50% relief for a month. Potentially you can get many months relief following uh, radio frequency of the medial branches. And there is good evidence for that. So our local, local protocol would be somebody who has a good short-term response to a facet joint injection would then go on to have two sets of medial branch blocks. Now they in themselves are not very sensitive or specific either. However, if you optimise how you set up to do it and how you where you place your needle and how much, what volume of local anaesthetic you give and what local anaesthetic you give, then you can improve that. So that is a picture of um, some radio frequency just at the medial branches there. And uh, what is recommended that you bring them in for two medial branch blocks. The first one you would use a long acting local anaesthetic, small volume. The second one you'd use a short acting local anaesthetic, small volume. The patient would then report shortly afterwards that they have had a greater than 50% pain relief and they'll be able to tell you which one was the short-acting local anaesthetic and which one was the long-acting local anaesthetic. The Pepsi challenge, so to speak. Uh, now, I personally don't do that. It's a bit cumbersome. I would just tend to use uh, a short-acting local anaesthetic twice. There's been about eight or nine studies and seven have been good and two uh, good results, two have been poor results. The two with poor results, ha their selection process was poor. The ones with good results, their selection process was very good. But you can see the numbers we're talking about here. So uh, that paper there by Nath, 
367 patients had screening blocks, but only 40 were randomised for RF. So you are eliminating a lot of patients. Um, I'm not sure how our figures would match up with that. Epidural. So there are three ways to do an epidural. Um, there's the intralaminar approach, which is the one that we would all think of first, I think, when we talk about epidurals, and that's the first one you can see at the top, uh, which is going between the spinous processes. There's a transforaminal approach or a uh, root sleeve injection uh, that is coming in from the side, and then you've got your caudal epidural at the bottom, which is coming in from the bottom. The most uh, compelling evidence is for the transforaminal approach, the best evidence for a transforaminal approach, and it kind of makes sense. Most of the time you're doing them because of a disc problem, um, therefore the irritation of the nerve root is on the ventral side of the epidural space. By going in transforaminally, you're putting your steroid at that point, rather than hoping for spread to that point. Um, various studies have showed that local anaesthetic and steroid can reduce the need for discectomy. It's most effective at L3, 4, 4, 5 levels. And interestingly, it's better for contained herniations. It actually makes extruded lesions worse and a greater likelihood of surgery. I don't know if you would agree with that. So I preferentially would do a transferaminal. However, I do get a little bit nervous about doing them and it's mainly for this. Um, obviously, you've got radicular arteries entering at that point next to the nerve root and particulate steroid intravascularly can cause ischemic spinal cord injury, which is obviously a devastating uh, complication on top of the other potential complications you can get from epidurals. So to minimise this risk, you should never, they say you should never perform it uh, above L3. Inject contrast under live fluoroscopy and then after a few seconds repeat to make sure you're not getting any intravascular spread. Some people recommend the use of a local anaesthetic test dose. Some people say don't use particulate steroids, use dexamethasone. The problem is there's not really any evidence to suggest that dexamethasone would be beneficial and whether it hangs around. Uh, and the other option is to do it an intralaminar approach where there is much less risk of uh, intravascular injection.